Trevor Lum, George Robinson, Apache Hinn, joining us by Starleaf. Uh, we have members that are here in the room and we have an apology uh, from uh, Trevor Clark. Uh, item three is the draft minutes uh, of the meeting held on the 14th of October. Are members content that it's a true <coughs> reflection of the proceedings of the meeting? Great. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. So there you'll be signed. Um, matters arising on page 13 of your meeting pack. Uh, there's information on Westminster bills for which legislative consent was or will be sought from the Assembly and the purpose and timing of the Health and Social Care Cross-Border Healthcare 2020 Bill. The um, Assembly European Affairs Manager provided this information following her briefing that was given to the committee last week. I think we had asked for, for that information. Are members happy with the information that's there? Is anything for clarity? Um, yeah. I think that information we should um, bank and refer back to it when <laughs> we, the previous conversation, oh, yeah. when we're bringing the licence. Yeah, well. absolutely. Okay. So are members content to note the, the, those documents then? Um, that then moves us on to the next item, uh, which is the oral evidence session with departmental officials on Brexit issues. On page 16 of the meeting pack and pages 3 to 27 of the table pack are the relevant papers. Uh, we agree to request this written briefing on the joint consultative working party and the rules of procedure. Um, specific <coughs> paper for that can be found at page 11 of the table pack. And you might want to take the opportunity then to question officials on that written uh, briefing that is uh, provided. Um, departmental officials should hopefully be joining us. We've won. We've. Okay. Do you want to maybe bring them in in case Andrew's not? Okay. Uh, so at this stage, we have uh, Tom Reid. Tom, can you hear us okay? I can indeed. Are you expecting Andrew to join you? or? I am indeed, yep. Okay, well sure, look, we'll, we'll wait just a minute to see if Andrew uh, joins in. Um, yeah. We maybe got through a wee bit quicker. Oh. Don't bring forward the correspondence, if that helps. Good to do. Let me check this. Okay no, just get agreement to move forward yeah. on the agenda. Okay, well, maybe, um, just, Tom, we'll, we'll hold off for a few minutes. We'll try and cover a couple of our other items off the agenda while we uh, wait on Andrew arriving. So, uh, with the members' uh, agreement, we'll move to the correspondence. Okay. okay, so the correspondence is... Me. It's item 10. Mm -hmm. Members, there are six items of correspondence at page 100 to 119 of the meeting pack. Uh, item 10.2 on page 106 of the meeting pack is correspondence from the Committee for Finance forwarding a response that it got from the Minister of Finance regarding EU funding that is yet to be received. EU funding briefings have been arranged with the special EU programmes body on the 18th of November and with the Executive Office on the 25th of November. Uh, are members happy enough that we yep. hold that correspondence till we have those briefings? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, under Chairman's business, I just had an item which is I met with the Carnegie Trust on Friday and they have been working with other devolved regions in terms of interaction and engagement with the public, uh, especially around development of programme for government. Um, they would said that they would like to present to the committee. Um, however, I highlighted them that between now and Christmas, we are absolutely stacked with what we have in terms of Brexit. So I had suggested that they forward to us a written briefing uh, between now and Christmas, and then maybe after Christmas we could schedule an oral uh, briefing with them, which would be an advance maybe of a programme for government if there was one uh, in sort of March, April time. Would members be content to note that, and we'll maybe write to them and ask them for that written briefing? Yep. Yep. No, okay. Not. Sounds like Tom ringing Andrew to say, "Where are you?" I think <laughs> it's Trevor. Oh, is it Trevor? Are you Trevor? We're all listening. <laughs> say, don't say anything. There's more than us listening. Oh, it's Trevor Lon. <laughs> Do you want to go to the forward work proof? Um, yeah, that kind of leaves me with the time of next meeting. <laughs> 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 Too early in the day. Yeah. <laughs> 
have yeah. potentially the transfer of order thing. functions. Yeah. On seven, you could maybe rattle through them. Yeah, it's not because it's going to be fairly straightforward. So let me just get the right page so that I don't read the wrong thing out for it. Yeah, members, if you'd like, we could take item seven, which is the department transfer of functions <coughs> order. It's on mm -hmm. page 61 of the meeting pack. Um, the First and Deputy <coughs> First Minister acting jointly proposed to make a draft a uh, department's transfer of function order Northern Ireland 2020. The proposed statutory rule will transfer the following functions. Those under section 19 of the Employment Act Northern Ireland 2016 relating to gender pay disparity information to move from the Executive Office to the Department for Communities, Article 3. Um, those under the Reservoir Act, Northern Ireland 2015, relating to the regulation of certain reservoirs, which would move from the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs to the Department for Infrastructure, that would be Article 4. And those under Article 23 of the Special Education Needs and Disability, Northern Ireland Order 2005, relating to the proceedings of the Special Education Needs and Disability Tribunal on a claim of unlawful discrimination under Chapter 1 of Part 3 of the Order and, and to the making of a claim, which would move from the Department of Education to the Department of Justice, which is Article 5. The relevant departments are content with the transfer of the functions and its proposed statutory rule, which is subject to affirmative resolution, will come into operation on the day after that on which it is affirmed by resolution of the Assembly. The Committee of, for Education and Justice have already confirmed that they are content with the transfer of functions, um, but I'm going to seek pr approval from the Committee that we would write to the Committee for Communities and the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs and Infrastructure asking whether they too are content with the transfer functions, which might allow us to get a full suite of agreement from everybody. Um, Martina? Of course, the, the members would need to satisfy themselves, but I can confirm as a member of the Infrastructure Committee the issue of the transfer functions of reservoir. We don't know how this mess started in the first place. It was never supposed to go to, to DERA, and it ended up there. It left the Executive Office uh, to go to Infrastructure. The Infrastructure Minister needs it for the operation of the reservoirs, and DERA is, and both of them have confirmed to me by written response that one is going to uh, release it, <coughs> the other one is accepting it, and the TEO has said they're letting it go. Of course, you might want to satisfy yourself on that, but there are questions mm -hmm. and answers to questions that can be found that you can see that both of the, the, the uh, departments and we as a committee of the Infrastructure Committee have been asking how did this happen in the first place. We haven't had a response or an answer to that, but we do need that function moved into okay. the Infrastructure Committee in order for us to deal effectively with issues that are arising over reservoir. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Mr Chairman, in the context of what um, Martina has just said, does us sort of writing and seeking additional responses perhaps slow up the process of this transfer taking place? Might it be an idea, given, again, I'm obviously I don't serve on the Infrastructure Committee, but given what has just been said in terms of, I think we can safely assume the opinion of that committee on the, on the issue, it may be an idea that we just give our assent to this here today, but I'm absolutely not hard and fast on the thing. It's just a okay. So just to be clear, there are two options. You could decide that following this meeting, um, contact the executive office and advise them that the committee is content with the proposed statutory mm. rule, or you can carry out your own consultation, as has been suggested. But it is, and I mean, I suppose before the assembly went down, there was agreement across the board in relation to this, and this was just something that wasn't progressed because the assembly had gone down. So, I mean, if you're content that we go back to the executive office and confirm that the committee is happy with the proposed statutory rule, it will then come back to us as a statutory rule fairly quickly. I think and that's I think probably what we should do, Mr Chair. Is there an option for us to do both at the same time? Could we go back to the, the Executive Office and say that we're happy for it to proceed, but at the same time... Not, it wouldn't be good practice because it, you know, this, this committee has said, look, we're content yeah. for you to make the statutory rule. It then comes back to us. Once it's a statutory rule, it can't be amended. It can only be annulled. So if there is any issue that arises, but if you're content at this stage. Um, I just want to reassure you, I'm not misleading. Mm -hmm. you know, no, no, mm -hmm. The Committee not. of Infrastructure have, we have raised this, we have discussed this. We've actually, the chair has tried to ask questions as to how it ended up in there in the first place. 
Uh, you have the functionality of reservoirs in the Department of Infrastructure, yeah. and you have the operational side of it in the Department of Agriculture, and we have got all sorts of problems with reservoirs yeah. Yeah. and yeah. catastrophic um, potentially sort of, you know, that's how they're describing what could happen if, uh, if planners are being asked to plan for housing development or anything else across a number of sites and the Department of Agriculture cannot in any way change, or Department of Infrastructure can't do anything about the law until it is operationalised and it's actually sitting in their, in their yeah. department. And both, I, as I say, I've received just of last week from both ministers confirming uh, that they are intent with this process. It should never have went to agriculture in the first place. It should have always went to the Department of Infrastructure. Sorry, if I could just correct something I said there. I said it could only be annulled. Of course, that's anything that's subject to negative resolution. Yeah. Yeah. This is subject to affirmative. So, I mean, the decision will be for the Assembly to affirm. Yes, so. yes. yes. And I was, that was the point I was going to make, because I know sometimes there are some out there that think that we don't give things our due process, but we can actually give, uh, go back to the Department and say that given the information that we have thus far and having had a look at this decision. We are content with it, but it still gets the opportunity to go back into the floor of the Assembly for yes. approval. So if there were members of other committees that weren't happy, they would be able to raise their unhappiness at that stage as well. So this I isn't the... I understand, I understand, Mr Chairman. You know, we did get burnt on an issue in the past where people said that we didn't give something due consideration. By the same token, one of the issues that does grind people's gears as well is how ground the gears get <laughs> And yeah. how long it takes to get anything done. So I think if we can crack on in terms of indicating our yeah. approval of the measure, plus allowing for a debate in the House because yeah. it's not mm -hmm. negative resolution, it's mm -hmm. you know, I think that's more than sufficient. I think we need to move and not get burnt because we could be causing a flood if we don't get the reservoir <laughs> sort of like so. Yeah. I think we've got all like sorts of natural disasters. Yeah. Yes, we're just trying to avoid here. all these natural disasters. I think well, we're we'll it's when the statutory rate for dealing with a plague of locusts comes. That <laughs> <not> really <laughs> work. But they are impacting <clears throat> the development in a lot of areas. For instance, in Derry and oh, Fort George, to uh, mm -hmm. name one, the expansion of McGee. All of those areas that are being refused because the reservoir is not being managed properly and the reservoir has fallen between a number of different stools and everybody is ping-ponging. Yeah, and so it needs to be in the Department of Infrastructure. The Department of Infrastructure wants it and then we can deal then thereafter. There's obviously going to be other things that need to be dealt with, but at least we know then we have a home for it. Yeah. So, are we so, just have, so we're just going to advise the, the Executive yeah. Office that the Committee is content with the proposal to make the statutory rule. Yeah. Okay. I see Andrew has joined us there, so we can now move back to... The earlier item and item five, the Brexit or 11 session with departmental officials. Uh, if we can welcome uh, Tom and Andrew. There we go. And you're both hearing us okay? Yes, thank you. Can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you, Andrew, and we can hear you, Tom. Yes? Yep. Okay. So, Great. Do we want to maybe hand over to yourselves or are you, to, to give us a brief introduction? Are you happy enough that you've tabled the paper? or um, Maybe say a few brief words, uh, but happy to go very quickly into, uh, into a conversation. Chair, thanks, thanks for the opportunity again to cover this. Uh, quite a lot happening, of course, at the present time. Uh, we're just waiting to see. Uh, there have been daily phone calls between chief negotiators last few days since the European Council last week, uh, which uh, seemed to ha land negatively uh, in terms of, of the way things seemed on Friday and, and indeed yesterday and, uh, and the day before. Uh, so the possible difference today uh, is that uh, Michel Barnier uh, was speaking to the European Parliament and uh, has, has said a bit more about willingness to talk uh, whether that meets what the Prime Minister said last Friday, as in the need for fundamental change in the uh, EU's position before talks could proceed, uh, well, well, we'll see what happens next. There's a further phone call, I think, between David Frost and Michel Barnier this afternoon, according to uh, what you're, we're seeing on the, on the news reports. So that, that's obviously very, very important and uh, potentially significant if, if they were to get back into uh, intensive negotiations based on legal texts. That's uh, what was asked for by the UK uh, in the discussions last week and seems to be on offer. Um, 
but I think the, the more important thing is whether there actually is a landing zone for the negotiations. Uh, we, we've, we've talked about this before. Uh, the main issues outstanding remain uh, so-called level playing field, open and fair competition, uh, state aid subsidies. Uh, you know, even even the terms aren't necessarily agreed. Uh, really that's not unfamiliar to um, those used to negotiations in relation to uh, this part of the world, uh, where uh, where how you describe things is never never quite the same. Uh, so the same applies in, in, in these talks, and that's one of the most difficult uh, areas of the discussion, obviously. Um, the uh, fisheries, I uh, think, clear signals that, that neither uh, UK nor the EU, with I think particular reference to some of the coastal member states, states no sign of, of uh, easy compromise on that issue. Um, governance remains an issue, as in how, how, is the, how would an agreement be overseen? And that links, I think, to the um, issue of trust, which is undoubtedly in the background following the um, uh, UKIM bill. So uh, that that's the, the big picture negotiations. Uh, there was a meeting of the Joint Committee on, uh, on the withdrawal agreement uh, on Monday morning early, uh, chaired, co-chaired co by Michael Gove, the Chancellor of the Chancellor of Lancaster, and Vice President Sefcovic. Um, and uh, that, that went, I think, pretty well um, in terms of mood and style. Uh, some positive uh, comments being made. Uh, still significant issues to be resolved. Uh, quite a long way to go in that process. But commitment to have a further meeting of the Joint Committee uh, around mid-November is being talked about in the hope that by then uh, the technical discussions will have advanced. There will be further progress on the, on the issues that remain to be resolved in the protocol. And uh, so a lot of intense work going on at the present time, uh, mainly at a technical level, um, involving uh, UK government and and the um, uh, the Commission. We've got a little bit of line of sight into some aspects of that uh, to try and make sure we push as hard as possible for a good and acceptable outcome. Uh, both First Minister and Deputy First Minister made their contributions to Monday morning's meeting, um, emphasising uh, the importance of securing uh, an agreement that respects respects all the political perspectives here, and that they were they're both articulated very clearly uh, in that discussion. And uh, that that meeting covered the full range of withdrawal agreement issues. It covered citizens' rights, uh, as well as the Northern Ireland Protocol and the parallel protocols, although they're much less much less difficult uh, in relation to Gibraltar and the sovereign basis in Cyprus, uh, and also the financial settlement, where there, there are still discussions ongoing, but that, that, that's all, that's the full, full panoply of issues around the implementation of the withdrawal agreement. So that was all covered off on Monday's meeting and is progressing pretty well. Um, but I think important now that there's the, the things that are, are most important for us, of course, are securing a fully acceptable approach to the uh, SPS checks on at the points of entry, securing progress on the del delivery of those points of entry controls uh, by DERA, and I, th I think there's, there's major progress on that happening. Um, and then uh, the four specified decisions for the Joint Committee, which, which we've talked about before. So those are the sort of main events which probably post-date the paper you have, and that's why I thought it was just worth, worth touching on those before opening up for for questions, so an awful, lot, lot, an awful lot of work going on, um, gearing up on planning assumptions and operational readiness with ministers, uh, in, uh, working across departments to fulfil those those obligations. So that, that's the um, I think those are the main things I'd want to cover. I uh, hope that's helpful. Unless John wants to add anything at, at that point. No, I'm happy not to. Uh, Thank you. You've covered everything there, and happy to move on to questions. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew and yeah, Tom. Um, thank you for that, uh, for the update. I appreciate that things are very fast moving and changing day by day, but um, we certainly appreciate getting the, <coughs> the paper from you as well. Um, I just know, Andrew, last week I think we had a presentation um, that was referenced. Are you, are you dealing with COVID matters as well as Brexit? Um, no, uh, only, only a little bit. Uh, I think none, none of us can escape completely. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the lead on that is elsewhere with, with uh, 
uh, with other colleagues. Okay. No, just uh, it was something that was mentioned last week. I didn't just know what was what was the run of it. Um, if I could ask you about the intergovernmental relations, which are obviously going to be pretty key in ironing out a few um, of the final issues going towards the thirty first of December, uh, but will become fairly important as well moving forward from the first of January. Um, has the executive ever endorsed the agreement on joint working and those draft principles which have sort of come out of the new initial review? Because we, we weren't there when a lot of these intergovernmental uh, principles and guidelines were established uh, and we sort of picked up the mantle from January. But have we had an official input into those? There's been, there's been a, a lot of work going on. It's, it's not on my side uh, directly, Chair, but it, it's from Neil, Neil Jackson is the expert on this work within the executive office. He's a, a, a full member of the uh, the working group across the uh, the other devolved administrations that I'm working with London on all, all, on all, all of that work. It, it, um, it isn't by any means solely about EU exit. Uh, and, and so it, it covers the full range of intergovernmental relations. I think the, the, the point that proved difficult uh, during the period when, when um, we didn't have ministers uh, was on on dispute resolution, and that bubbled up. Well, maybe more than bubbled uh, in relation to uh, disputes about uh, the, the common frameworks issue and the repatriation of powers uh, with the um, withdrawal, uh, um, the initial legislation on withdrawal uh, led to the Scots and Welsh governments taking exception to what was being proposed and challenging it on the grounds of the Sewell Convention. And, and the, the reality of intergovernmental relations is that it hasn't been that great uh, since that time. And the internal market bill really did exacerbate that very strongly, especially the, the issues around um, the financial provisions within the bill, which allow uh, the Westminster administration to uh, spend money on anything within the devolved, devolved space across Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. So, it, dispute resolution is the difficult bit. It, it isn't resolved. There's a proposal. It's making progress. There was some discussion at one of the uh, recent uh, JMCEN meetings. Uh, there's further work to be done. Uh, I, I think that, 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 that I would suggest, since, since, since neither Tom or I are the specialists uh, on this topic, uh, I think if, I think you have sought and, and no doubt that will happen. There'll be an, an, an evidence session with Neil uh, and colleagues who are uh, in the lead on this and ha have, have handled the, the detail of it. But assuming progress was made on um, it, get resolving uh, the issues, there's, a, there's a, an emerging proposal in relation to the handling of dispute resolution and so on. But it would only it, that would would only be ratified. Are we subject to ratification at a full meeting of of the JMC? Uh, which hasn't met, I think, the last plenary of the Joint Ministerial Committee uh, is now nearly two years, if not more ago, um, because all the, all the work among the departments has been focusing on, on the uh, European negotiations issues. OK, th th thank you for that. And, and of course, I mean, intergovernmental relations at, in their broad sense are going to become increasingly important moving forward. And if we take... Then moving on to the example of the Joint Consultative Working Group um, and maybe taking a look at the role of, of it because, I mean, uh, trying to extrapolate an analogy, it's been used occasionally that the what's happening between the UK and the EU is a divorce. I, I sometimes feel that Northern Ireland is the child that's there, that it's going to be left of, of having to listen to what London is saying, but it's also going to be bound by rules that are there from Brussels under uh, the protocol. And, and the input that we would like to be able to have um, as representatives of people here in Northern Ireland, for example, moving forward in terms of um, any changes that there might be or divergences that there might be going forward. You know, how, how, how do you see the... I mean, is there any formal mechanisms that have been laid for that in terms of something like the Joint Consultative Working Group, which is between EU and UK, what essentially is going to affect businesses and communities and structures here in the north. So how, how does that work under this Joint Consultative Working Group? So the, um, um, 
rules of engagement and, and the working methods of the Joint Consultative Working Group have uh, recently been published. They were uh, they've gone forward as a proposal within the, uh, the on the European side. Ultimately, that they'll, they'll go for for ratification, uh, but they confirm the undertaking that we as as the Northern Ireland Executive would be represented. Uh, so that that's a good development in the certain terms of formalising something that we were expecting, um, but um, that's uh, that needs to be worked out in detail, and uh, that there'll be an ongoing a lot of ongoing work, as you say, Chair, in terms of, of the way in which these things have to work looking forwards. Um, there are provisions for uh, dispute resolution in the protocol, so so the first port of call on issues that relate to. Um, the interface between uh, uh, UK and EU, or things affecting the way in which the protocol is operating, there are mechanisms pr provided for in that in, in the protocol itself. Uh, and I think uh, if the, 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 I'm not sure how uh, or, or what what might um, 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 need to be done to furthermore in, in terms of. of Moving forward, uh, if there was something in between the two, between the governments, between the, the jurisdictions, uh, the, the four jurisdictions, under the terms of the intergovernmental review. Um, sorry, I'm just just to correct myself there. The the uh, the JCWG, the undertaking has come from the UK side that we would be involved. That's not formally part of the the uh, European document, the formal documentation in there, but but it, it is a fulfilled promise. And will be activated as that comes into being. But I think the the important thing is that is that there are there are ways and means for for resolving disputes that's provided for. And we need to uh, obviously the first thing is to is to get resolution of the issues uh, that are outstanding and allow, allow that to be um, to be established so that we move into into the post transition period in the best possible place. If those, I mean, you're talking there about processes and agreements. There, I mean, are they just at discussion stage? Are they at agreement stage? Can we see those? Can we find out? Because I mean, like yourselves, everybody's going to be quite keen for getting sight of, of, of these mechanisms and agreements because you know we're we're almost at November and this is going to have to take precedence from the 1st of January that we can find out ways to, to progress. So th th those items that you've described there, you know, wh where are they? What, what, wh where are those documents and, and are they agreed and can we see them? So, yes, we can, we can send you a link to the um, um, published, uh, pr they still, still formally have a status of proposals, but they're, they're heading for endorsements in relation to the um, ATWG. Uh, those emerged, I think, uh, within the last week or ten days, and then, um, in terms of the the um, protocol, there are there are provisions within the protocol which, again, we, we can uh, highlight specifically to you. Um, I think they're they're already uh, already exist uh, either within the protocol, either within the protocol itself or within the withdrawal agreement, and of course any any dispute resolution provisions. Within the main withdrawal agreement, uh, would apply to the protocol, and and of course that's at an agreement level between the UK and the EU. Does the Northern Ireland Executive do we get representation at that? Is that guaranteed? Is that accepted, or is it just in, interpreted that the UK will take that lead on our behalf? Which we really don't want. Um, so uh, the, the these are. Formally, matters of international relations, so they're, they're accepted matters. Therefore, the formal standing in all those processes is with the UK uh, UK government. Uh, but uh, what they have done is provide for for our membership of the of the JCWG. That's that's a a, a UK decision. Uh, I think um, um, the hopefully the the um, JCWG rules of engagement it should be in the in the briefing paper. Uh, that has has gone to you. So hopefully that that's 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 available for you. Uh, and you know, if there are questions arising from that when you when you've considered those, we can come back and, and provide further information. But the, the, the formal standing in anything is with because as I say because it's international. That's that's for London to deal with. 
uh, I think the, the fact is that is, is that where an issue concerned us, uh, there would be a strong opportunity uh, to um, to make representations and to fulfil our fulfill our, fulfill our part. And uh, in the UK also ha has given this undertaking in the context of the specialised committee meeting that 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 we would have our place in the uh, in the, this, these aspects of ongoing work. So uh, it, it's. How happy to get get further details of the, of the, those things. Yeah. Uh, um, if, if if the material you already have leaves you with further questions. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll come back to you for that because you know I think there's a healthy enough fear that whenever it comes to us here in in the assembly in the north leaving. Uh, our future in the hands of those over in London. We don't seem to do just so well. So we, we might come back and work out how our interventions uh, uh, work best on that. Um, Doug, pass to yourself. Thank you, um, Chair. Andrew, thank you. Um, I'm sure we'll see a lot more of you over, over the next uh, number of months. Uh, we've gone from negative reporting over the last few days, slightly more positive reporting uh, today. Could be back to negative reporting uh, tomorrow, uh, and I know there are big strategic issues such as state aid, um, you know, w which are being played with. Which I'm not sure we've got much of a, a skin in the game on that. But could you just give us a bit of maybe commentary on where we stand in regard to the the border point of entry posts, whatever you want to call them? Um, I, I, I'm believing that the three are breaking ground tomorrow in Belfast, Larne, uh, and Warren Point. Um, but the EU want them up and running, uh, and the VAT system be in place by the first. Uh, of January, um, are we likely to meet that? Are we likely to achieve that? Uh, are we tracking it to see where we are? Uh, yes, tracking, tracking very carefully. It's uh, um, being watched very, very carefully by ourselves, by by London, and by Brussels. Uh, this all 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 matters immensely, um, and I think very hard work being undertaken by. Uh, colleagues in the in DERA uh, and, and you know the the, the sooner that, that these things are established, the better in terms of just giving assurance and confidence to all concerned, not least uh, the business community, so that people are, are know exactly where they stand and what they have to do. Uh, so I think the, the the fact of the matter is that uh, there will be still some work to be done uh, post New Year, but uh, the, the key thing is to ensure that we have. Something which is operationally effective. The objective of the SPS checks, so, so sanitary and phytosanitary checks, are needed to protect health, uh, animal health, plant health, human health. Uh, so the the absolute what matters most is having the staff and systems to facilitate that work. And uh, you know, if, if if buildings aren't uh, uh, fully complete. Then, then that doesn't stand in the way of there being effective checks. So that, that's that's um, Dara are gearing up to be able to fulfil the obligations, to be able to to undertake what needs to be done. Uh, that's that's really good work being done very rapidly. Uh, the time pressure is immense, uh, but it's it's progressing, and a confidence that, that, that a result can be delivered. There is still work going on at the negotiating level. In relation to the application of the protocol, the precise interpretation, and uh, I think that, that's also been given in evidence by uh, DERA colleagues to their respective committee in the assembly. That, that, that there's, there's a lot of work going on on that uh, key objective, as uh, we, we represent in our discussions with London and with Brussels, and as DERA officials and our ministers are, are all saying the same thing. Uh, there needs to be uh, an effective supply that makes makes this work effectively that minimizes uh, the uh, obligations and the and the, uh, the disruption that could result uh, that's written into the protocol in a couple of places especially article 62 of the protocol the places of not an obligation so this is, this is an agreed part of the text an obligation on both sides to use best endeavors to minimize uh, the effect of of um, checks on um, the flow of, of, of goods between NI and GB, and especially uh, the, the, in this particular regard, making sure that the uh, the flow of, of, of essential goods is, is, is maintained. That it says uh, best endeavours to facilitate the trade between Northern Ireland and other parts of the UK in accordance with applicable legislation 
taking into account uh, their respective regulatory regimes as well as the implementation thereof. And that's a very important commitment uh, and uh, is being explored at technical level to see exactly how best to do that. Uh, the paragraph goes on to say that the Joint Committee shall keep the application of this paragraph under constant review and shall adopt appropriate recommendations with a view to avoiding controls at the ports and airports of Northern Ireland to the extent possible. Now, we know that, and it's implicit in that sense, in sense that uh, controls are needed, uh, but they should be as unobtrusive as possible. They should facilitate flow, and that, that, that's a, a very, very active uh, set of discussions going on at the present time, and in, very important that that's secured, uh, and that there is understanding both of what is technically required, uh, the uh, presentational sensitivities around that, which are, which are very important, of course. I think that those are, are well understood um, by all concerned, uh, so that it can be made uh, effective and, and as, as well facilitated as possible. So major work going on and, and good progress being made. Andrew, thank you. I mean, that, that, was, that was really interesting, I see. Um, uh, and therefore, I would say that the, the dear Minister and Department are delivering these border posts uh, at speed to the best of their abilities as it stands now. And I take it that the, the uh, no EU office uh, issue has been resolved. Uh, and that the 15 EU staff who will work uh, within Northern Ireland uh, has also been roughly resolved. Um, <clears throat> and, and could you just let us know, we, we did say that for the 27 to be able to react to the deal that the 15th of October was, was the cutoff for that, that's clearly slipped. So what do you think is now that hard stop date where the 27 can react to anything that we come up with? So, um... The, in terms of union presence, that, that's, that's not formally resolved. There was a the, the, the proposal you mentioned uh, was raised at the uh, meeting on, on Monday. Uh, it's it's uh, it has there has to be a balance between delivering the commitment that is made in Article 12 of the protocol, uh, which allows for commission presence, while keeping that as. Uh, it's unobtrusive again. They aren't asking, as you say, they're not asking for a diplomatic office. That that's that was withdrawn some time ago. Uh, I don't think there was yet a full agreement on that point. That would have to come to the specialised committee and the joint committee in due course. But I think progress being made because uh, the, the, there is uh, a, you know, a recognition of, of, on all sides of the uh, the balance of what Article Twelve says and intends. Uh, in terms of, of cutoff dates on the main talks, uh, I wouldn't uh, wouldn't dare to put a, a precise date on it. Um, the, the the underlying reasons for a deadline around this time are because um, legal text has to be agreed in detail, and that not, that hasn't made that much progress. Uh, there's some bits of text have been exchanged, but actually actually that that, that will, is a quite a time consuming process, and um the um it then has to go for ratification and the ratification procedures include european parliament and each member state has its own uh provisions in relation to that and that depends we don't yet know the nature of the agreement and, and exactly what ratification procedures would be required so that's why 15th of october was a good day to aim for uh, as well as being a european council date uh there, you know, it, it certainly can't be uh, too late near 1st of January, that that just becomes totally unrealistic. Where it crosses from being tight and difficult, which it's it's, it's close to being a, a challenging timetable, where it turns from being a challenging timetable to an impossible timetable, I'm not, I, I'm not, uh, can, I can't give you give you that that uh, that judgment. But uh, I think the next, literally the next week or two are really critical, and, and if there isn't substantive progress. You know, even if they resume, as as has been has been speculated, they resume intense talks uh, today, tomorrow. That, that that doesn't leave a lot of time. So time is is it's genuinely tight, but uh, you know, uh, it's it's never over till it's over. And and, and I think that, that it has to come to a head um, within the next few weeks. And then similarly on the protocol. Those, those things need to be resolved, partly because they're some absolutely essential for uh, businesses planning. 
Andrew, thank you. I have no, but I'll not ask it just for brevity. Thank, thanks, Chair. Okay. Martina? Sorry. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Tom, uh, for being with us this, uh, this afternoon. Um, Andrew, as you know, there's only 71 days left and, until we're dragged out of the EU. And just picking up on what Doug has said, there are 27 member states, the European Parliament, and we were told by October it's over. So the clock is ticking. And it's in that context that I would like to ask you around the at-risk goods. Um, I'm hearing about a potential financial bill that could be brought forward by the British government similar to the internal market bill, uh, which would mean that the British government may be intending to override that aspect of the withdrawal agreement. Are you furnished with any information or are you hearing anything even in the rumour mill? with regards to though that aspect at risk goods where the EU and the British government were to agree um, what was at risk but that the British government we believe or were being told uh, intends to bring forward a financial bill that might once again destroy another aspect of the withdrawal agreement just like the internal market bill did. So I, I don't, don't have fresh intelligence on that. I think the what the point you make was was made I think openly and publicly by the UK government at the time they announced the provisions on the UK uh, UK internal market bill. Uh, they, they they said that they they, they would bring forward proposals uh, in the finance bill, uh, which would uh, uh, provide for. I think, I think the the. The reason for doing so, again, just just to, as as presented, uh, was that the default within the protocol is that if there's no agreement, then everything is treated as at risk. So the the what uh, has been said from London is that that's that's so problematic that they need, they they took the view um, that introducing legislation to uh, a notwithstanding clause. If, if you, if that's the that's the shorthand for the uh, clauses within the internal market bill that, that have the effect of over, overriding uh, the withdrawal agreement. Uh, so to in parallel with that, introduce a notwithstanding clause in the finance bill to say uh, that they, as UK government, would determine what is or is not at risk. That, that that's an announced intention. Uh, it, it doesn't need to happen if there is an agreement in the joint committee. Uh, yeah, and so but my 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 thoughts are obviously like many others here in the north turning to the fact that we could be crashing out without a deal and it's about what kind of contingencies were put in place and what we need to prepare for that potential eventuality so if that is the case yes. the british government has already signaled its intention to once again unilaterally uh, decide to break the withdrawal agreement, even though coming out of just just reading from the papers and what we've seen from the meetings that took place last week, the joint committee and the specialist committee that it once again reiterated uh, the full implementation of the protocol in the withdrawal agreement, its commitment to the full implementation of the protocol. But if it were to follow through on what it intended to do, that would would that be the full implementation of the protocol? So there's, there's, I think, several levels to the decision there. So uh, even if the main negotiations on a free trade agreement don't, don't come to fruition, the withdrawal agreement still stands and the, the process of, dis, of negotiating and determining the, the uh, outcome of, the, of that work on the protocol would still be an obligation. Uh, everyone we talk to uh, reminds us that uh, the intention is that the withdrawal agreement is is all weather, all purpose. It's, it's, it stands whatever the circumstances and needs to be implemented, whether or not there is a main trade uh, future relationship agreement of any sort, either fully fledged, uh, comprehensive agreement, or uh, just a, 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 a narrow uh, uh, so-called bare bones FTA. So that that, that that's the the contingency that could possibly give rise to the intervention in the finance bill and further clauses overriding would be if there isn't an agreement in the joint committee and that, that 
that should be happening anyway. The process is ongoing. There is there are technical discussions uh, to seek to determine at risk goods, and that, that so that's being taken forward by both sides. We're not privy to the detail of that, but but th that process is ongoing, uh, and uh, I think there's the the. the what the UK has said in the command paper that is that they would only accept that goods are at risk if they're you know, genuinely and demonstrably uh, likely to to enter the single market. Uh, that's uh, that's that goes beyond the wording of the protocol, uh, which is is very precise as as uh, as most such legal documents are. Uh, the there are a, a range of different approaches to looking at this. Uh, um, are, are, our ministers have made representations on this and set out views as to what uh, should or should not be treated at, at risk, all with a view to making sure that the functioning of our economy is, is as, as sensible and, and realistic as possible. The, the key thing is to, the, the, we haven't yet by any means exhausted the process of seeking agreement at, at technical level and through the specialised committee of the joint committee. That, that, the, the, every reason that should still happen, and it's only if that breaks down so the main talks could break down, but the um, joint committee process might not, might need not and should not break down. And it's only if it does that the uh, issue around the finance bill would, would then be invoked. Yeah, but that is at variance with what was agreed, the British government's obligation in the protocol with regards to at-risk goods. So, yes, the commitment was to seek agreement, yes. So today, um, one of the tweets, sometimes you go to Twitter to get information when you're at the meetings, um, I see the uh, seeds gardening market have advocated that for producers in the north that they should go to an all-Ireland supply chain based on what the British government has introduced uh, in relation to seed law. When that comes into play uh, next year, because of the um, the withdrawal from the EU, so I'm I'm looking at, for instance, Tesco's has got an All Ireland supply chain. Sainsbury's it does not as yet. It doesn't have an All Ireland supply chain. And is it your understanding that potentially there could be some big names and? Um, that are currently present and operating in the north, um, that we could end up losing uh, those from, they could end up having to either leave or we would recommend that suppliers would go and get produce on an, the all Ireland basis, use the island of Ireland to seek their produce, just like the seed gardening market is recommending today. Yes, I've, I've, um, I saw those, saw those tweets earlier, and uh, I, don't, I don't have a, a, a detailed or precise answer unless Tom wants to come in with anything to add, add to this. But uh, the, the principle principles remain that there's still a process underway uh, and an obligation on both the UK and the EU to sort sort out all the issues of movement of of goods of all sorts, uh, and uh, including everything that would be a would be needed in terms of sanitary, sanitary checks, and that, that's intended to include um, plants as well as as well as products of animal origin and live animals. So that 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 work is still progressing, and I think the the urgency uh, is to get to a place where resolution and clarification of all these issues is sorted out as, as quickly as possible. If I could ask just one more question, Chair, I know I probably could ask too many questions when it comes to Brexit, but could you could you give us information about the Shared Prosperity Fund uh, that's going to replace the structural funds? Um, how much is that going to be, given that we're set to lose the 0.5 billion uh, from the EU when we're dragged out? So what is the share of that that is coming to the North um, so that those organisations and groups are at least furnished with the information about what may be coming from the shared prosperity fund that we've heard about for for a long, long time. Um, not sure, Tom, if you have any more detail than I have on that one. No, I don't, Andrew, unfortunately. So I, I think that that's led. I think the, the undertaking was 
uh, re replacement of funding, re replacement of lost funding. But I, I would I would defer to colleagues in the Department of Finance uh, who have been working very closely both with with Treasury and with MHCLG in in London on that issue. Uh, and I, I think that, I think that to, to pick that up with with Department of Finance officials would probably be the next step for us. So let, let us look at that and come back to you. There's a lots of programs in the TEO that comes out of EU programs, whether it be peace funding or other uh, funding streams that uh, would impact on the TEO. So, Chair, could we come back to get that information? We, about we that? also have a briefing yeah, from the fun. Department of Finance and um, the EU funding body in three weeks now. But okay. No, okay, we're, so we're we'll looking. put that on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, Emma? Yes. Thanks. Okay, no, Thanks, Chair, and thank you both for joining us again this afternoon. <clears throat> I just have a question around, um, and I know we had uh, presentations last week from the uh, Equality Commission or the Human Rights Commission and the 26 County Human Rights Commission, and they, together with the Equality Commission, they had issued a statement last week um, with con just concerning their worries around the Internal Market Bill and, and some of the amendments to the clauses that they have concerns. Um, and I know you've you've mentioned in your briefing paper about the fact that they've written to the British Secretary of State around this and they had a previous statement a few weeks before that about particular amendments and the implications that this could have. I'm just wondering if there's been any further update from that. I know that they were asking for a response from the British Secretary of State um, at the end of last week, and I've, I've not heard if, if we've got any uh, assurances uh, around some of the rights protections that they're asking for. <coughs> so uh, we, we have discussed this with uh, NIO officials. Uh, I, I can only say that they, they gave us a, a firm reassurance that uh, the, the issues are, are manageable, but I don't have, don't have detail on that. I think that's, that's awaited. Uh, the, the letter, as you say, uh, the correspondence has gone in and we're waiting on a more detailed response, but uh, I did get uh, a first order assurance that in, in relation to the concerns about the uh, ECHR, that they're, 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 they were um, not, not uh, should, you know, shouldn't be seen as a cause for concern, uh, but we're, we're pressing, we're pressing for detail on that. Uh, uh, and, and we'll get, if we can add to that, it may be best that there's a direct response from uh, NIO to that. Of course, no. Thank you, and I, I know I know as well that uh, in the briefing paper that you provided, you made reference to the fact that TU officials are having discussions um, to formalise funding beyond the the twenty twenty three deadline. But I suppose the worry is that yes. given that they're sort of expressing concerns at this stage and haven't got any clear response from NIO or British ministers that we're talking about funding for two years' time, and we don't. We don't have answers to some of the questions that they've expressed at, at this point. Thanks, Chair, and thank you both. Okay, Christopher, no, you're happy enough. Um, we're having a small technical problem here, as in I can't see the other members of the committee, but I know that you're there. Uh, <laughs> sounds a bit scary, but um, what I'd like to do is I'll just call yeah. you um, in the order that I saw you joining the Starleaf conversation. That you've got you up on the main screens now. So can I ask, Trevor, do you have any questions or Trevor Lunn? Uh, no, Chair, not at the moment. Uh, this is my just but I have the technical problems too, so I haven't heard it all. But no questions at the moment. Okay. Um, Grant. Um, George, do you have any questions? Chair, I'm fine. I'm just observing, just listening. Okay. And then finally, Pat, do you have any questions? Uh, thanks, Chair. And, and like Trevor, my line was dropping in and out, so I might have missed bits and pieces. So. I uh, apologise if this question has already been asked, but in terms of the Peace Plus funding from the EU and the British government, has there been any legal guarantee set down for that? Thanks. Um, um, I think that there's still ongoing discussions on the precise uh, levels. There's, there's certainly commitments made by both UK government and the EU to uh, Peace Plus, but still Further detail and detailed discussion going on again. I look to Tom if there's anything you can add to that, Tom. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a key point, Andrew. There's very strong commitments there, but the detail has still been worked out. And when, when would you expect some greater detail on that? Um, I think that's again something that, that will, will need to be resolved within the next few weeks because 
yeah. uh, you know, all these things are, are, uh, are, you know, things that need to be sorted out during this, this transition period and resolved. So I would, I would be hopeful and confident that would, would come through the next month or so. Okay. Thanks for that. Thank you, Chair. Okay. I think, uh, potentially Andrew, we could probably push and press you for a lot more commitment than that in those answers. However, given that you're almost going to be an ex officio member of this committee for the next few weeks and in the run up to the 1st of January, I'm sure we will have ample opportunity to, to cross-examine you again. And I suppose maybe just um, in a serious note that any of the requests that we have made today, um, if you do get updates on them, if you could forward them to us, um, because we would like to be able to explore them with you whenever you're back again or, or explore them in other forums before we reach the end of the year. Um, if I could just say then, or ask the... Uh, Northern Ireland Executive, uh, if you could just um, give us the details about that confirmation that the Executive will be represented on the Joint Consultative Working Group, that would be very useful for us if we could get that uh, forwarded to us in, in writing. And as I say, no doubt we will have you back in a, in a few weeks anyway for, for some more questions. So on, on the back of that, we'll thank you very much, both of you, for coming along today, and we'll, we'll let you go with that. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Tom. Bye. 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 Are we? Ah, that's you. I thought that was the safe right thing. Did you? I had my own that screen. Okay, so I thought we had the CRC online, but it's actually. It's Marie that's in the Me. bottom part of the screen. In the half seat. We maybe just take a one minute break yep. uh, just to get the, the guys for the next presentation lined up. So we'll take just a one, two yeah, minute break. Is the Northern Ireland. Move back into a public session and we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is item six, which is the allocation of funding uh, for the Community Relations Council. Members, page 22 of the meeting pack. Uh, gives you the information and we have representatives from the Community Relations Council today via Starleaf to brief us on the allocation of funding under the Community Relations Council's funding programme. If I can take this opportunity to welcome Jacqueline Irwin, the Chief Executive of the Community Relations Council, and also to welcome Paul Jordan, Director of Funding in the Community Relations Council. Um, just to advise both of yourselves that the session is live and being recorded by Hansard and will be published on the committee webpage. You're very welcome to both of you here today to give us the information. We appreciate that. And maybe um, if you want me just to pass over to yourselves to give us a bit of an input and then we can move to members questions after that if you're happy enough okay thank you chair can i check if you can hear me clearly yes we can indeed yes thank you thank you i want to begin by offering an apology that our chair cannot be here today as members may know martin suffered a terrible family bereavement and has taken some time off I'm therefore joined today, as you say, Chair, by Paul Jordan, our Director of Funding and Development. And as the focus of our evidence this time is on funding only, as you requested. Okay. Members will have received our paper, I hope, um, providing an update on development since we last gave evidence to the committee. As, the paper, as uh, from the paper, members will have read that CRC has completed our accounts for 1920. So we're able to give you an update beyond the 2018-19 figures we provided last time. The audit of the accounts for 1920 is uh, almost complete now, and we're due to receive the audit report in November. We're not anticipating any changes to the figures in our paper to you as a result of the audit, but if there are any, of course, we will advise the committee at that time. Since we last spoke to you, we have almost um, we, sorry, we have also completed um, the usual annual review of our funding programs, and we have further developed our online evaluation processes, which are now able to more accurately reflect the geographical reach of our funding. CRC continues to work in collaboration with a wide range of organisations. So, as usual during the review period, we also met with key stakeholders in relation to their plans. We engaged with the District Council Good Relations Programme, colleagues in the Executive Office, 
and many of the groups that we currently fund, particularly those like the Rural Community Network that are delivering in rural areas. This was to explore the opportunities for new projects and to see how additional engagement might help to identify and address the emerging needs in the different council areas. It was also to encourage a joined up approach and greater complementarity across all the initiatives. The paper you received updates the committee with information related to that last year, this year and next year. On page three and onwards, members will find our grant expenditure for last year, subject to audit, as I say. Um, and we've also included the distribution of our funds across all district council areas, with a specific update on the areas raised by the committee during our last evidence session, that being Derry Stavan and Mid Ulster Councils. The figures for 1920 take account of improvements in our online evaluation processes that have helped us reflect in greater detail the geographical reach in, um, of our core funded groups, as opposed to where their offices are based. As further work is undertaken on our new online system, it is expected that the full impact of the improvements to our evaluation processes will be more evident in next year's assessments. Turning to the current year, on page six of the paper, there is information on how the welcome statements we put in place for this year are being addressed through our core funding programmes. Uh, obviously, bear in mind, um, it's not a complete picture as we're only a little more than halfway through this financial year. Welcome statements are only part of the way in which we try to encourage and support applications to our funding schemes. We run many information events and shared learning fora, and we carry lots of information on our website and social media. This year, in addition to all of that, CRC has arranged for each member of staff in our funding and engagement teams to have a specific focus on an individual council area. We hope this will enable us to have an even better knowledge of the issues in each council. Also, knowledge about the local agencies and staff working there, and from their point of view, a regular point and familiar point of contact with us. We're also aiming to identify rural champions with whom to work on the issues affecting rural areas. Our chair, I think, will be a great help to us with that when he returns, as he has a strong background in rural issues. We'd also be happy to hear from you and your colleagues on any points of contact in your area or issues in your area. On page 11 of the paper, we've set out our discussions and work with the Executive Office and District Councils this year, including information on the development of our joint evaluation methods. Moving on then to the plans for next year, on page 12 you will see the proposed welcome statements for 2021-22 uh, financial year. Um, they will accompany the opening of the next round of our core fund scheme, which is due shortly. Lastly, on page 14, you will see our continuing COVID-19 response. All our grant administration procedures are online, which has been very helpful during the pandemic. All our shared learning events and meetings are also taking place online using Zoom and other forms of teleconferencing. We have also been supporting others that needed help with teleconferencing. In September, as Members may know we ran Good Relations Week entirely online, and despite the current circumstances, the week was a great success. We had 292 online listings, including events and digital content, and that was a 39% increase on 2019. All of the councils organised events as part of the week. We had 97 pieces of print online broadcast and social media coverage. And I'm really pleased to report that we had 547 pieces of social media coverage from third parties. That's other interested groups transmitting our messages or supporting our messages as they go out. The TBUC engagement forum took place during the week. Um, it always attracts a large audience, normally around 130, 150. Um, this time it was even bigger. We had 203 in attendance. In the paper, we've listed some of the initiatives we have supported during the pandemic, and Paul will be able to give you more detail on any of those now or after this session. 
We have also included an example of one of our statements of encouragement to show the approach we are taking to helping groups feel confident to deliver services to, community, to meet community needs during this dreadful time. We would also be really happy to have other suggestions you may have of ways in which we might help during COVID-19. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Jacqueline, thank you very much for that. And maybe if we could just begin by um, extending our uh, condolences to Martin and, and that bereavement and, and where he is at the moment. We, we hope that things um, settle and get sorted for him there. Um, and then we'll, we'll move then to questions. If I could maybe just pick up, you, you highlighted there, uh, which is great to see the identification of rural champions um, as maybe a way forward for working out in the rural communities. Can we maybe just ask you to explain to us just where, what, how you see those rural champions sort of developing, what you see their role as and, and how they might go about that, just sort of the thoughts behind those? Yeah, yes, of course, Chair. Um, well, as I mentioned, and, it, and it's included in the paper as well, we already work with, with quite a number of groups that are based in rural areas. But the issue we're not quite clear on is, are there other things that are um, stopping people feeling confident about doing good relations work? Or are there other ways in which they can be helped and supported to find their way to our door? And that's the conversation that we want to have with people who are very much steeped in rural work, um, either because that's part of their day-to-day -day business or they have historically been involved in that work. Um, also, I suppose um, it's a confidence building measure and sometimes um, people are anxious about approaching a new funder, particularly a funder that they haven't worked with before or not familiar with. And sometimes if they are able to approach someone or know someone who we would describe as a rural champion, that person can bring them across to us for further conversations. Um, also a challenge function. I mean, it's um, we think we do a pretty good job at, at keeping contact with our networks and a very, very wide range of organisations. But you don't know if that's absolutely true until somebody else comes to tell you you've missed something here. Here's someone else you should be talking to. And that's the way in which we hope rural champions will be able to help us. It's a rather grand way of putting um, what we're looking for there. It's simply other people who can be conduits to contacts and work in rural areas, issues in rural areas, or other things that we can be doing to support work in rural areas. And in terms of, I know, for example, um, the, the local council in my area will actually send funding officers out to actually sit down with groups and help them even uh, to apply for funding. Um, the, yeah. the sort of, the, the, there's no element of trying to disbar people from applying. It's get as many applications in as possible and work through it and provide that support. Is that something that you offer or do you look out at other, do you take a scope of other organisations to see other good practice for engaging groups and, you know, is that something that you would do and, and then are you involved in forums that allow you to pick up on other bits of good practice and then incorporate that into your own work? Yeah, well, well, Chair, we do, we do all of those things. The, we run an awful lot of our own events, and we're also very frequently invited into other people's events, and we are very strongly in favour of doing that. Uh, Paul would be able to give you some information about the various funding fora that we have been involved in. We're very strong advocates of running those at a local council level. Uh, we go along to the, their events, TEO goes along to their events. Um, it's a much more collaborative exercise. It also means in the days before COVID, when people were coming along to those events, um, they were seeing a lot of funders in one place at one time. So it was a better use of their time as well, um, uh, precious as it is when they're trying to, to get on with their work. In terms of supporting groups, again, um, Paul will be able to give you some information about the way one of the things we always say to people who are interested in doing good relations work is that you don't have to have a fully worked up idea to come to us and talk to us. In fact, we encourage you to come as early as possible, even if it's only a very loose idea of what you want to do. You may not even have an idea of what you want to do. You may simply recognise that there's an issue that needs attention. We've got a lot of experience of what is going on all across the region. 
large groups and small groups and we're very often then able to point out examples of things that have been tried elsewhere or put people in contact with someone who's working on a very similar issue and in that way help them to develop their thinking we're not interested in turning down applications we're interested in supporting applications and making them better and stronger in order for us to be able to say yes to them so you're quite right we're far far more interested in hearing from people and talking to them that's the development side of our work and we put a lot of time and effort into that okay uh deputy chair doug uh, thank you and, and thank you for that I, I didn't actually have a question but i was just looking at something and it, it caught my eye so i just to ask um uh, I mean, I'm looking at some, where, where, where the monies are going, and I, and I see here that tides uh, have got um, something running in the areas that are also part of attacking paramilitarism, criminality, and organised crime. Um, uh, and I'm looking at Lurgan in particular, Drumgas and Kilwilkie. Um, communities in transition are doing the same sort of thing with monies coming from their direction. You're doing it likewise. Is there repetition here, or are you just working hand in hand on this? Yeah, I, I'm going to I'm going to pass in a moment to Paul to talk to you specifically about how this works. But in the main and in general, the organisations that we core fund, the whole principle of that scheme is to enable those groups then to be able to go and deliver projects, small or large, for other funders. So in the case of Tides, Tides is a core funded group of ours, but we don't fund them to do the same thing as they are doing for, for, for instance, the special EU programs body. We're supplying some of the underpinning resource that enables staff in that organisation then to go out and deliver programs. But if I pass to Paul for a moment, maybe just to talk specifically about that example. Yeah, I mean, in terms of... of uh, our core organizations one of the things that we're doing with them is to make sure that they have a base that they can work from core costs are probably one of the most difficult costs you can get for an organization to secure but they're one of the most important if they have staff in place and that's including admin staff and and running costs for that what that then has meant is the likes of tides are able to take on contracts and work and deliver good relations programs through other funding sources that they wouldn't be able to if they didn't have the kind of the infrastructure in place. So it's it's where we're looking at across the board and certainly in terms of when we're doing our evaluations, we're looking and talking to each of those partners to see what work is happening, what's been generated from that. And certainly it's it's something we'll look at in terms of the impact that core is enabling a group to have and to maximize what the work that they're doing. Paul, th thank you for that. I mean, I think you answered it right at the very end there, is that as you're talking to, to other partners. My concern was, is that you have two organisations working in exactly the same spot, delivering exactly the same thing, um, which is a repetition of resources. Uh, but if you're saying that you're talking, so that's not happening, uh, then I'm, I'm happy enough. Um, sure, thank you. Okay, Martina. Uh, thank you both. Thank you for the information. Uh, I know that Emma and I, and I'm sure others, um, when we received the previous presentation, we were keen to interrogate it further and to get more information as to where the funding was going to. So I'm looking at the, uh, the work supported in, in Derry and Shaban and Mid-Ulster, and I see that there are 30 organisations being supported for core funding. Um, however, I'm quite surprised to, uh, to ascertain that there's only seven of those organisations in Derry, Straban, um, and that, which represents 23% of, and there's only one of them in Mid Ulster, but I'll leave that, I suppose, to, uh, to Emma to pick up. So, and then when I look at the, um, the funding, the core funding, that has been given out. Um, I can see that the junction has received the, the lion's share of it, followed by the bands form. Um, but I, I'm just, um, I would like more information on these, um, the consideration that has been given, for instance, to this list of the meagre seven organizations in Derry, because I know the good work that's going on in the city across the city, particularly 
in the districts, uh, particularly organisations, whether it's Gallia Women's Group or others um, in Derry, um, doing cross-community work, outreach work, a lot of work that would be classified as uh, very good work around good relations. And I was glad to hear, um, Jacqueline, what you said about organisations should come to you first to help you, that you can help them navigate their way into drawing down the funding and make sure that, for instance, Gallia Women um, is, is doing that. I, 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 would, I would assume that they do. But when I then looked at it's page 45, the number of organisations, am I picking this up right? Maybe you could explain to me. The number of organisations then that have had their funding uh, either withdrawn or rejected um, in, in Derry and Straban. So I'm trying to understand if there's 30 organisations, only seven from Derry and Straban getting core funding, uh, many of them from outside of the area, and I'm sure they're doing good work, but when you live in an area, you understand the area best. And then the number of organisations who live in the area, who work in the area, particularly in the districts, and they're not seeming to uh, get through the process. So could I have some of that explained? Yes, uh, uh, a lot of questions there. I'll answer um, some of them Thank you. Um, at a general level. Then Paul, uh, Paul will be able to give some uh, information at all of the information you need, we'd be glad to to send that on uh, to you afterwards, uh, Martina. Um, two things to say. first of all, all all of the core funded groups that we work with are in the program deliver are working with these at the local level. That's part of the mechanism that they use. They're very often working in networks for delivery and Paul may be able to say something more about that in a moment or two. Um, the other thing to say, I should, I always say um, um, when we're talking to anybody, do if you know of someone who is doing really brilliant community relations work and they are not receiving funding from in time, send them to our door. Uh, we are not interested in uh, closing the door on any good work can support it, we would be more than glad to do so. And I'd be aware of some of the work that's going on that you're referencing there, Marina, going on at local community level, and, and, and some of our uh, funded groups are, are involved in that. If there's more room to happen, as I say, we'd be very, very glad to help. But the other thing I have to say is that, I'm a, a sad to say, I suppose, is that we can't fund everything that we would want to fund, particularly on the core fund side of our business. We always have groups that we would be glad to fund if we have the resource. We have we keep a reserve list every year when we do the core fund assessments. There are always groups left on that who, if if we had the money, we would be we would want to fund them. Their work is good enough for that. Um, so uh, so again. Um, the list that you see before you isn't everything that we would want to do, far from it. Um, but I'm going to pass over to Paul now, maybe to say something more about some of those groups. Yeah, I mean, in terms of that, I mean, um, there's a lot of groups that we would fund through our uh, Community Relations Culture Diversity Grant Scheme, um, and that's through our small grants. Um, one of the things, like, I'll give you an example in terms of how we're working. Um, Junction and, and Hollywell um, are organising an event next week for 18 organisations, smaller organisations. Um, we have been asked to, to come and speak to that group about funding that's available. Um, so only due to delighted, uh, they'd ask the invitation for us to join them. Um, if there's anything uh, that is going on, um, we would want to be connected. We have worked with the um, I met with the uh, good relations officers um, over the last while. Some of things coming through from them as initiatives will be taken forward. They have mentioned each of the areas that they're working in, and there's some groups and organizations there. So what we have planned to do this year in terms of taking the information events a step further and actually say, look, um, are there local issues that people are coming together to work on? And is there something that we could be helpful in help making that happen? So um, the guys are going to come back to me in terms of they said there's a number of initiatives that they want to be 
come together on in terms of within their areas. So I'm only too happy to sit down with those groups. Uh, and it really is a question of um, tell us what you want to do and let's see what we can do in partnership on that. So um, the door is always open and it's just for us, it's trying to make sure we're doing and getting it out as much as we can. Regret saying that to me, Jacqueline mm -hmm. uh, and Paul, that the door is always open. No. But I, I really am anxious about those groups and organisations who live right in the and work right in the heart of the community, understand yeah. the community, go from one year stagger from one year to another, trying mm -hmm. to source funding, and they are doing sterling work. And again, mm -hmm. I just throw out that, and it's only one of many. Uh, the Gallian mm -hmm. Women's Organisation, I'm sure other organisations now will have given out to me when I come home without shouting them out too, but we all have them. Fantastic mm -hmm. organisations that do good work, and yet they're always struggling to, to try to get some funding. So, Jack and Paul, I will direct those organisations to yourselves because it's simply, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's concerning the 30 organisations that are delivering, say, for instance, for Derry and Straban and Mid Ulster, and there's only one organisation that lives in Mid, Mid or works in Mid, Mid Ulster, um, getting funding out of that, and only seven from the district in Derry and Straban. That's not representative of the community that I come from. I can attest to that to someone who lives there, but. Look, we'll pick you up in your offer and we'll see how it goes going forward. Yeah. Okay, Emma. We'll be delighted to work with you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair. We'll be delighted to work with you on that and hopefully change that profile. Thank you. Okay, we'll pass now to Emma. Thank you, Chair. I think we've got a wee bit of a lag in the um, technology. Um, thank you both for for uh, joining us this afternoon and for their presentation. And I know what had sparked this was the, the briefing that we'd had back in May. And I just brought the, the pack up last night when I was going through this because the figures seem to have changed um, sort of, uh, maybe not dramatically, but considerably between 2018-19 and 2019-20. And what I suppose was alarming the last time around was as a Mid Ulster MLA, the fact that Mid Ulster was um, coming last and that, that our funding was significantly lower than, than some of the other council areas. Now, I know that you've put the disclaimer on there that a lot of this funding and these groups are active in Mid Ulster, but they're not based there. And so, as Martina has pointed out, RCN are the only one, they have an office and can do brilliant work. And I know that the junction isn't in Gannon, so technically speaking, it's Mid Ulster council area even though it's not um, uh, uh, fallen into our constituency within the assembly um, remit. But again, the junction do really great work. But just following on from what Martina had said there in terms of your, your door being open and you know working with groups, um, I might bear that in mind as well because I can think already in, in sort of my end of the constituency in Mahara of a, of a group that work with young people, a, a, a genuine cross-community group. Because um, I'm just conscious that obviously... A lot of the, the work that you've referred to here is about redressing um, issues that have come about as a legacy of the past. And in Mid Ulster, we've had significant impacts because of the conflict. Um, so I suppose I welcome that. But just when you when you get this this table of figures, to when you drill down into it, some of, some of these look quite heartening. But then when you drill down into the actual implications or the actual reality on the ground. The, the, not those men, not that many of those groups are sort of would be known within their community and, and as working there. So um, it's something that I'll be following up with you on. And, and thanks very much for providing this. Okay, uh, thank you, Emma, for that. Um, uh, yes, do you want to comment on that, Jacqueline? Yeah, uh, just just to say. Again, happy, very happy to work with you on that. And any of the groups that you're speaking to, as I mentioned, uh, if they have, if they're not clear on what they want to do, don't tell them not to worry about that part of it. Um, just come along with the conversation. We can help to develop the idea. They don't have to have something very clear in their mind's eye when they open up the conversation with us. First of all, just if that's any encouragement to some of the people you're speaking to. Brilliant. No, thank you. The, the group that I'm thinking of are, are working already and they survive year to year and they're using the International Fund for Ireland um, funding and it's always a scrambling match 
at the end of the year to try and, and get the funding that they need going forward but it's just because of where they're based in Mahara and I know there's reference there to work being done with school children in Maharfelt which obviously is a neighbour in town and they are they're doing they're doing great work with young people from I mean from across the it's a, it's a mixed town and they work with everybody and they're doing really good work so I'm, I'm gonna yeah. follow up with you yeah. on that thank you yeah <clears throat> okay we have two members that are online that I can't have. I don't have direct eyesight to at the minute, but I'll ask them if they have any questions and wish to come in. So, um, Pat, would you do you have any questions you wish to wish to ask? No, Chair, I'm happy enough with the questions that have been asked so far. Thank you. Okay, and George Robinson is there as well. George, do you have any questions you would like to ask? <coughs> From Paul of Putin, the Empire loves the graphics on that area. And I um, was just wondering, from a council perspective, do you hold meetings with the council? And I know at the present time um, it's not so easy you know, because of the COVID situation. But would you, particularly with our councillors, you know, the councillors on, uh, on the ground would be on the ground as much as we, we would, would have a close association with a lot of the you know, community associations and so forth. Just wondering from that aspect, <laughs> how, how, you, how you correspond. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, we don't have regular meetings with the councillors. We from time to time councillors who will get in touch with us about particular issues and we're always glad to work with councillors when they do. Our most regular contact would be with the good relations officers in each of the council areas. Uh, Paul mentioned that earlier on. He, um, we, our staff would do regular meetings with them on funding issues, funding fairs, or as Paul has done over the summer, a review of the work that's going on, where the gaps are, where, where other work might take place. Um, do some work with them on um, commemoration work and so on. So, so it tends to be themed and it tends to be with the staff and the councils. But certainly, yes, from time, we'll also attend meetings where the councillors themselves look for that. And we always welcome those opportunities uh, to do that. As you say, councillors have their ear to the ground, have a lot of local knowledge, and we're very to work with them when we have the time to do that with us. Yes. And uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Much appreciated. Okay, thank you. Thank you. There, George. I, I don't see Trevor uh, on any of the lists here, but I just want to, to call him just in case he pops up from somewhere. Uh, Trevor, definitely not online with us at the moment. Okay. Well, Jacqueline and Paul, thank you very much for coming along to the committee today and answering the questions and certainly to making that offer for members to contact you should they wish um, to be able to work with local groups and hopefully raise the profile uh, both of the work you're doing and the rates of your funding, which would be appreciated. Um, and to thank you folks for coming along, not least, Paul, whenever people broadcast this committee from Down Patrick, it always helps brighten up the day. So thank you very much for that indeed. And we'll, we'll let you go on that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you all of this. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, members, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and people can follow up, I think, um, with, with people there separately. So, um, can I ask, just in terms mm -hmm. of uh, the clerk, if we could be furnished with the details of the email addresses to contact them directly? If it would yes, helpful. certainly. Perfect. Okay, um, we move on then to item eight uh, on which we have is the report from the Interim Advocate for Victims, Survivors of Historical Abuse. We uh, further to the request for an oral briefing, we had suggested a written briefing. It's on page 78 of the meeting pack. Um, there is an introductory briefing from the new Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Childhood Abuse has been scheduled for the 27th of January, uh, just a few weeks after the new Commissioner is in place. Our members happy to... Chair, okay. um, I've been asked to raise a, a few issues sure. um, around this, and I don't know how to take it forward, perhaps with your assistance, you'll be able to advise me. Um, some general questions that people have asked me to seek answers to, specifically, firstly, to put on uh, record a recognition of the work that the Interim Advocate did, did undertake 
and I know that uh, there was a, a division of opinion in terms of that, but to say that you know there are people who were very appreciative of the work and the effort was put in by the interim advocate. So there, to reflect that there wasn't a uniformity of opinion uh, on on that issue. Um, just some specific questions. So, number one, uh, what reason exists? for the delay in the establishment of the support services because these were supposed to be in place in June or June or July. And I understand um, we're in a COVID environment. Given that the interim advocate had been working to establish support frameworks and to put them in place, I think it's, it's useful if we could seek clarity on that. Secondly, if it is the case that those frameworks have already been established by the interim advocate for support if this then does this then mean that we're simply in a position where you just have to press the start button and if so why has that not been done yet um and then um just thirdly if, if it uh, given that it hasn't been done when can we expect it to be done so those i, I was asked i was contacted and asked to raise some of those issues and if we can maybe, I know that there's a further briefing coming from, but I think it's important just to put that on the record of the committee. Okay, certainly. Yeah, um, Martina. Um, I would like to concur with what uh, with what Christopher has said. Um, some people would know that I was at the privilege of being the junior minister that established uh, this inquiry, and uh, and saw through the appointment of Sir Anthony Hart. And he made the recommendation about an apology. I'm very mindful of what Christ Christopher has said in relation to the number of groups and organisations, some of whom uh, would be deeply appreciative of what the, uh, the interim advocate report and what's contained within it. And there would be others who would feel that their force is not represented in the report because of the difficulties in that relationship. So I think we have to accept the fact that this report is not inclusive um, and therefore whilst it will go on and be handed over to the, to the new commissioner, uh, it needs to be done with that understanding that it's not inclusive of all of the groups. I know Savia and others did not uh, engage with them, so we just need to be mindful of that. But the delay in the support service does not necessitate waiting on the commissioner to take up her post. Um, it has simply gone on too long. These victims have waited long enough. Yes. We need as a committee an understanding as to why this is not in place. It should have been in place in the summer. And therefore, I think from this committee, if there is collective support, that we should be asking the TEO officials to get a move on, to get it done, and to get the support services put in place ASAP. And that would be the few that's shared by all of the victims across all of the groups. Yes, I think that's right. Doug? Yeah, um, Chair, I, I, I think we've all been lobbied to a certain degree about roughly the same thing, but it's important to, to echo that about the support services. Now, I know the VSS were providing some interim support, um, but, but the delay in setting up the support services for these guys is just, you know, it's, it's, it's not tenable. And I think we, we really need to, to drive this, this forward. And that's coming from, from all of the groups involved. So it's not just from one particular faction, so to speak. You know, um, Chris has quite rightly said that, that, that there is a split, but it's coming from all. But quite interesting as well. And I don't just want to echo what has been said because that's been, it's really quite clear. But just to pick up on something that Martina did say uh, and was raised with me. Uh, when she was a junior minister, she was responsible and engaged with these people. For some reason, the junior ministers now have stopped that engagement. So there is now a, 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 that, that there's a break somewhere. So where they were getting it before, and they were getting update briefings, and they were engaging um, with the two junior ministers, that has now stopped, and they're, they're looking to see if they can re-establish that again. Um, you know, so uh, I, I think there are there are some issues. Um, if, we're going to write, if we're going to write to the Executive Office, that's certainly something yeah. that should be included in a letter. Yeah. Just and I, I would imagine both junior ministers would be more than willing to meet. I, I, I'm in no doubt. You know, but, but I mean, it's an important point to me. Because yeah. it, and and that, 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 that breakage might be because we've, we've been stood time for the last three years and everything else is going on. That's not a, a fault or a criticism. It's just a reality that there's a break. 
I think, to be honest with you, Doug, what happened was when the, when the inquiry was set up and when the judge was appointed, then the TEO, it was mm. the Office of UFM, had to step back and let the work be done and the recommendations yeah. take place uh, without any interference. Yeah. And so, but now that they're out the other end, we engage. and mm. the, um, you can see the redress now being put in place, and they are at the process of uh, looking around an apology, and that then it is, I think, a time now for to mm -hmm. yeah, to yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, I'll just check, uh, George, do you have anything you want to add? No, what the other members have said there in the last few minutes. Okay. Totally support what, what they're saying. Yep. Okay, thank you. And Pat? I'm okay, Chair. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, so, and I, just for note, I'm not drawing people in to give points, it's just I can't see yeah. some of the members on the screen here to see if they maybe are indicating or not, so I'll just call them each time just to check. Okay, members, look, I think we've got uh, a commonality there of a series of questions that we'll ask off officials and hopefully get some answers for uh, our next meeting then. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Item 9 is our forward work programme. If members can bear a little bit with me, because we've had a few changes. Um, and updates in the past few days. As members will know, on the 4th of November, we have scheduled to meet with six councils to uh, look at Brexit issues. Um, just to let members know that another four councils have come back to say that they would also like to join us. Um, so that leaves us with a number of options. If I could offer just a suggestion, and if it's agreeable, then we could go with it, and then if not, agreeable then we can explore further options but the suggestion at the minute is that if we take the six councils on the one day on the 4th of November as we had suggested if the following week on the 11th of November we take the further four uh, councils and then take a few other items of the written briefings that are scheduled for that day and then we take the two oral briefings that are presented on the 11th of November and move them to the following week where there is space for them that will allow us to get back in the sink, but to take six councils, then four councils the following week. For I think it might be um, just a bit repetitive and too much for us to take 10 councils in a row on the same issues. It would be a, a very repetitive and, and a very long session for us. So would members be agreeable and happy if we take the six on the one day as planned, the four councils the following week, plus the uh, written briefings that are due that day, and then on the 11th of November, those two oral briefings move them to the week after. Would that be agreeable for members? Yeah. Fine. Fine, yeah. Yeah, it's agreeable. Who, who, who hasn't taken up the offer just for... Uh, there's a <laughs> Who's the one? Yeah. Nobody <laughs> wants to name Causeway Coast and Glens and <laughs> that would be most wrong. The, the reason I say it, uh, well, I mean, it might be worthwhile well, just them. giving them a call, just call, to, yeah, in case yeah, it's yeah, missed, there's yeah, a lot yeah, happening. Yeah, just yeah. I think yeah. we would we'll go back and check. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they wouldn't want to be the only one there left out in that, so... <laughs> Can I just clarify <laughs> that members are content then that no other substantive items are put on the agenda for the 4th of November meeting? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, okay. give us time to and just in case the fifth council then comes back, the fifth sort of outstanding council comes back and says yes, we want the, the meeting on the 18th or the 11th, sorry, would be a very long meeting. At the moment we have the victims' payment scheme and we have the CEO strands under NDNA. If one of those has to move to then the following week, the 25th, do you have a preference? Just whoever, in terms of availability, you'd be happy to work with yeah. official availability? Mm -hmm. That's grand. Thank you. I'm just trying to see is there anything that coincide with the work that you're doing the following week? You know, does it make I think there's you there's two funding ones. Program and yeah. especially you programs body. I mm. think the the update from the, the clerk earlier when we were chatting about this that new decade new approach element might be quite substantial. Yeah. So having it at the back of five councils with other written briefings might leave a very long meeting. The victims payment um, session might be slightly shorter and would be taken mm -hmm. in turns. So it might be if one had to to move back that the, the new decade new approach one might be the yeah. might have to deal with availability yeah yeah depend yeah. on, on well, that. that's grand thank you okay members that's good thank you for your uh work on that that leaves us on item 12 of any other business no. and then 
Item 13 is the date, time and the place of the next meeting, which is in two weeks' time. Uh, available in here, but the councils are all joining us online by Starleaf. So maybe for some members that are travelling greater distances, maybe joining us by Starleaf would be uh, more agreeable because all the members are all the... Shot an old hike from where I live. <laughs> <laughs> okay members um, thank you very much for your attendance today and we, we'll close the meeting at that thank, thank you. you thank you this is the northern Ireland assembly committee room 30 this is the northern Ireland assembly committee room 30